We now come in our study of salvation called Soteriology in Theology to the subject of standing and state. Our last lesson we dealt with the assurance of salvation and we gave verses proving the doctrine of eternal security. In other words, that once a person is saved, they are always saved and they're always safe. You can't lose your salvation and go to hell after you trust Christ as your personal Savior. However, you still sin after you're saved and that has consequently caused people to doubt their salvation. They think, well, if I really would have gotten saved, maybe I would not have fallen back into this old habit or done this bad thing that I've done. And it also causes people to begin to think that they've either lost their salvation or that they ever got saved to start with. And then it also causes a misunderstanding of sin if they do not understand the biblical teaching of sin to where they begin to judge salvation based on outward fruits alone and not realizing that sin is a lot deeper than just touch not, taste not, handle not. Uh, there's a very sin nature that's inside of us. So we're going to deal in this lesson with standing in state. You've been saved, but now you sin and you mess up. What does that mean? Does that mean you lost your salvation? Obviously not. So we're going to address this issue, and it's going to deal with doctrine, experience, and trust. In other words, facts, just like we gave last time. What does the Bible say about the believer after he's saved? Does the Bible teach like what John Wesley uh, promoted, which was a type of sinless perfectionism, that now that you're saved, you can live without sin because God saved you from sin, now you don't sin anymore? Is that what the Bible teaches? Is that what the New Testament lays out? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, so we're going to deal with the facts, and we're going to deal with the feeling, the experience, because all of us go through this in our Christian life, the struggle, and then we're going to talk about our faith in God's Word and how do we combat this? How do we deal with this in our Christian lives? Now, let's go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 7 and I'll show you this conflict. Romans chapter number 7. And I'm sure you're familiar with this struggle in your own personal life. Romans chapter 7. Here's Paul the Apostle. He wrote three quarters of the New Testament. He wrote the book of Romans, and he's describing his own personal struggles. Romans chapter number 7, come down to verse number 12. Romans seven twelve. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was that then which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, excuse me, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of God. Of sin. Now turn over to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. We'll talk about the basis of this teaching. Now, obviously, from Paul's words, you could see and sense that he has a struggle that we all experience as believers. We have things that we want to do for God, things that we want to do for Christ, things that we want to do for others. 
things that we want to do that we know is right to do, but then we don't do them. We have sins of omission. And then we have sins of commission. Things that we do that are wrong that we really don't want to do. I mean, I believe when folks come to church, they really want to be here. And I'm, I know there are some people that are very pretentious and some people are sacrilegious and all that kind of stuff. And it's all just ceremonialism and those kind of things. But for the most part, my church, our folks, I believe when you come here, you want to be here. I believe that most Christians deep down... They want to serve God. They start out maybe in January and they say, I'm going to read my Bible this year. And they really have the intentions to do it. They want to do right. But there's a struggle and there's something that's prohibiting them and hindering them from doing those good things. There's a battle that's taking place. In Galatians chapter 5, we'll get to this toward the end of our lesson, but he describes the War against the flesh and the spirit. They are war against one another. And so when we talk about standing in state, we're going to discuss the division between the flesh that wants to do wrong and the spirit, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and your spirit that's been born again and made anew that wants to do right. There's a battle. There's a conflict. And so I've actually wrote this out here, standing in state, and we're going to see the differences here as we go through. Because one of the best ways to learn things is by noticing their differences. And these are different, and we're going to be able to see that as you sure, I'm sure you've experienced this in your life. Now, how is this all possible? What's the basis for this, the foundation of this? Look in Colossians chapter number 2, come down to verse number 9. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9. For in him, which is Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now he mentions this circumcision of Christ and he's not talking about the time when Christ was eight days old and he was taken into the Jerusalem to be circumcised. You know it's not physical fleshly circumcision because of verse number 13. Paul is dealing with Gentiles here and he talks about the uncircumcision of their flesh. Yet these Gentiles, because they trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they experienced a spiritual circumcision. So let's notice what happens here. There's a circumcision, verse number 11. A circumcision is a cutting away of the flesh. You read about it first with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15 when God gave that ordinance to Abraham and for him to be circumcised and to circumcise his his son Ishmael, and then when all of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were come into this world at eight days old, they were to be taken and to be circumcised, and that was a sign for the Jewish people. And of course, circumcision is a cutting. Now notice the cutting separates something here in the text. Look down in verse number 11. It's a circumcision made without hand, so it's not physical. This is not dealing with a surgeon in an operating room. This is the surgeon Jesus Christ. This is the surgeon God. It's called an operation, but it's not a physical operation. It's spiritual. Notice that it separates the sins of the flesh. Notice also there's a baptism. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. There's a baptism. This baptism here in the passage is not water baptism. Water baptism puts you into water. Spiritual baptism puts you into Jesus Christ. This is spiritual baptism. It immerses you into Jesus Christ. And also notice that it buries your old life. You're buried with him by baptism. Notice also in verse number 13, there's a quickening. He says, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened. To be quickened is to be made alive. You talk about the quick and the dead. That's the living and the dead. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
When you cut into the fingernail, if you cut too far, you get into the quick. That's the living part. So when God saved you, He quickened you. He gave you life. There's a resurrection that takes place. And this raises you with Christ. Notice also in verse 13, it guarantees your forgiveness. So consequently, back all the way up to verse number 10, you are complete in Jesus Christ because of this thing called the circumcision of Christ. Now most of you probably know Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God cuts, and it cuts between flesh and spirit. So when you got saved, there was a cutting away that took place of your flesh that divided that from your spirit and from your soul. Now you know that you are a triune being. In other words, you have three parts to you. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. I think in subsequent lessons, or previous lessons I should say, I've covered some of this. God made you a body so you could be conscious of the world around you. He made you a soul so you could be conscious of yourself. It's your soul that will be somewhere for eternity. And he gave you a spirit so you could be conscious of God. When Adam sinned, he told Adam, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam took of the forbidden fruit, he ate it, and he lived to be 930 years old. He didn't die physically that day. As a matter of fact, God did not pronounce physical death as a punishment of man's sin until after the fact that they had already eaten. Then he said, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Adam died spiritually when he took of that forbidden fruit. Therefore, man comes into this world in the image of Adam and has a dead spirit. When you get saved, God quickens your spirit. He cuts away the sins of the flesh from your spirit so the part of you that God saves is separated from the part of you that still sins. I mentioned this previously in our study of the assurance of salvation when we talked about the union of the believer with Christ. You are joined to Christ. The part of you that's born again cannot sin. So this takes place when you trust Christ as your Savior, it's called the circumcision of Christ. This is the foundation of this teaching of standing in state. Now let's break down and let's look at some analysis of this division here. And I've already given you some of these, but we'll break these down. Notice, first of all, that the, the Spirit is born again. The Spirit is born again. That's John 3. John 3, 3 and 3, 5. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The spirit is born again, but the body is born only once. The body is only born one time. Back in Romans chapter number 7. In Romans chapter number 7. Verse number 18, Paul says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And so the flesh has only been born once. The Bible says, as in Adam, all die. So that will bring us to the second one here. You'll notice that your standing is in Christ. Your state is in Adam. And let me clarify what we mean by standing in state, okay? Your standing is your position. In other words, we could have termed this uh, your position and your practical life. Your positional life is, once you trusted Christ, Ephesians chapter number 1, you're seated in heavenly places in Christ. So the position that the believer has is one of completeness in Jesus Christ. However, practically speaking, you're walking around here on this planet... And you're getting into trouble. You're looking at things you shouldn't look at. You're talking about things you shouldn't talk about. You're hearing things you shouldn't hear. You're doing things you shouldn't do. You're not doing things you are supposed to do. And so the practical it has to do with the state that you're in. How do I meet thee, my brother? I think that's what some old Puritan used to see. Every time he'd walk to someone, he, he would say, do I meet thee praying? 
In other words, are you steadily in a state? What is your state right now? You might be backslid on God. You might not be reading your Bible. You not, might not be thinking about God. You might not be in prayer. You might not be in fellowship with God. You might be way out where, from where you should be. What's your state? What is your practical life? So that's what we mean when we say your standing and your state. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Come down to verse number 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look in verse number 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now you got put into Jesus Christ by spiritual regeneration. Spiritual, I'm just going to put regen, okay? You got in Adam by natural generation. You talk about genealogies. And people do all these genealogy checks. Natural generation is you were simply born in Adam. In verse number 46 of chapter 15, he says, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Okay, so Titus 3.5 would be a great verse for this. Titus 3.5. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so you've been regenerated. You've been born again spiritually. That is your standing in Christ. Naturally, you just have natural generation. After you got saved, you didn't lose the distinctions that you had physically that you brought over from traits from your mother's side or from your dad's side. Uh, if you got saved and you had already lost hair, you didn't all of a sudden start growing hair. So you want to realize the reason that this body still dies is because it's still dead. The part that got saved was not this body. Remember when we studied the adoption under the eternal security and we talked about your body being redeemed. That's part of your salvation that hasn't been completed yet. Your adoption has not been realized yet. You have the adoption papers, but it hasn't been finalized. It'll be finalized when Jesus Christ returns. This body still, you walk around, you look, you can't tell who's born of the Spirit and who's not born of the Spirit. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 3. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not, canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You just can't look at somebody on the outside and say they're saved. Because the natural generation just shows a depraved man or woman. Spiritual regeneration takes place on the inside. All right, now I gave you the verse back in Colossians. Our standing in Christ is that you are perfect and you are complete. That's Colossians 2.10. Our state is that you are incomplete and you are imperfect. I'll give you a good verse for that. That's Philippians 1.6. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, God is still working on us. In Christ, God is not still working on us because we are sinless, we are complete, we are forgiven. In Ephesians chapter number 1, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ. We're already just as good in heaven with the door shut. Practically speaking, there's a whole other ball game. You're not complete yet. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse number uh, 13. I'll give you this one as well. Philippians 2, 13. He says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So you have to work out what God's worked in. In other words, God saved you, and He saved you for a reason, and you are to work out His plan in your life, which is not complete yet. You have problems with self-esteem. You want to find your value and your worth and your self-worth self and your completion in Jesus Christ. You want to find your identity in Jesus Christ because He loves you. You are forgiven. You are complete. When you look to this flawed image, you're always going to see a flawed image. The mirror is always going to 
be cracked. There's always problems here. And if you focus on the old man all the time, it's going to pull you down. You've got to realize, in Jesus Christ, you're saved. Thank God for that. Now, the next one here, come over to uh, 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter number 3. And I've mentioned a lot of these, so I'm not going to dwell on them. 1 John chapter 3, come down to verse number 9. This kind of goes along with this one. You're sinless in Christ. Look at it. Whatsoever is born of God doth not commit sin. In Adam you are sinful. What did Paul say in Romans 7? He said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. He said, I am carnal, sold under sin. That's your flesh. Your flesh is no good. It is sinful. When you commit a sin, you're committing a sin of the flesh... And that sin is attributed to the old man, not the new man. Anything you do that's bad is the old man. Anything you do that's good is the new man, which is Christ Jesus inside of you. Consequently, you could say this. In Jesus Christ, your standing is you are called a saint. You said, I thought saints were just those people that, uh, you know, get put into sainthood after they die. Now you've been listening to you know, the news too long or watching uh, uh, Catholic television programs or whatever. Uh, a saint is a living person. Never in the Bible is the word saint used just for those believers that have departed into heaven. A saint is someone that's saved on this earth now. In Christ, your position is a saint. In the flesh, your position is a sinner. So consequently, sometimes we say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's the right estimation of yourself, but you're also a saint in Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, when you examine this a little further, you find out in Galatians chapter number 5, he says, I want you to walk in the Spirit, and I want you to produce the fruit of the Spirit. But before he talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, and I'm sure you know the nine different aspects of that, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, against such there is no law. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Before he talks about that in Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the works of the flesh. You see how these things are so contrary? The works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, Galatians chapter number 5. Turn over there and look at this. Galatians chapter number 5, I mentioned it previously. The struggle and the battle that you are facing, now that you're saved, is one that you have on the inside, a desire, because Christ is inside of you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wants you to do right, and you want to do right, but then you have this flesh that wants to do wrong. Some of you have brought a lot of baggage over into your new Christian life. You brought a lot of habits over into your new Christian life. And that flesh does not want to let go of those. And the devil will use those things as strongholds. And so when Paul talks about spiritual warfare, he deals with the mind and the battle that you have in the mind. Because your mind will tell you, your carnal mind, the mind that's after the flesh, will tell you, you have to fall back into those ruts. You have to fall back into those habits because you can't live without it. That's the wrong thinking. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself and gets the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And previous to that verse, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That baggage you've brought over, those ruts in your life and habits in your life you brought over from your old life, that's a stronghold. The devil uses that ground and says, you've got to go back. You've got to. You're addicted to this. You can't let it go. And God says, through Jesus Christ, you can. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, Philippians chapter 4. All right, Galatians chapter 5. Notice in Galatians chapter number 5, come down to verse number 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now we'll come back to that at the end of the lesson. But notice here there's a battle going on between the spirit and and the flesh. These things are going back and forth and they're fighting one against another. So what you want to understand is the spirit is going back and forth to this and on the inside the new man wants to do right. On the outside the old man wants to do wrong. So this battle is ensuing inside of you and the works of the flesh are produced by the flesh. But notice the contrast. The fruit of the spirit is something that's produced not by you but by the Holy Ghost. That's the new man on the inside. He produces a fruit. It's not you producing the fruit. You can take credit for the works of the flesh, but you can't take credit for the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit comes from the Holy Spirit. Now we can also mention a couple of others here. Your, um, your standing in Jesus Christ is one of liberty. In other words, in Christ you have liberty. Your state is one of bondage. And that's like I mentioned to you before, that the devil tries to keep you into bondage by way of the habits and different things you've brought into your life, and you have to cast those things down. In Christ, you have liberty. This idea that our teaching of Christianity is one that brings people into some type of religion is foreign to the New Testament. We serve God because we want to. We serve God because of love. Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth us. It's the love of Jesus Christ for us that causes us to do what we do. It's not because we feel like we have to, that we're trying to produce a work of the flesh. If you get into that idea where you're trying to serve out of works, that means you're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. You should serve out of love. Therefore, there's liberty. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 1, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. So you want to understand that. And then, of course, we can say your standing in Christ is one of eternal life. And your state, your flesh, is one of death. This body is still going to die even if you're saved. If you trust that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, your flesh, your body is still going to die. You have to understand that. And sometimes Christians, we go through this period of sorrow and turmoil where we get upset and worried and concerned because we face death. Well, death is a natural thing for the natural body. But we have a supernatural thing from the Spirit of God that we're born again. And that's the part of you that's never going to die. That's the part of you that has everlasting life. Now let's talk about practically how do, we, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this struggle? And hopefully this application can help us bring some stability. You are not crazy. I'm just giving you some good news. You're battling this flesh. You're going back and forth with these bad thoughts. You're going back and forth with these bad feelings. You have some things that are good that you think of that are based on the Bible and think, based on Christ. Then you have those old ways and you're battling that. You're not crazy. All Christians battle that. And you say, well, I don't battle that. Well, you're not honest or you're not a believer one. If you're saved, you battle this. Or you have just nulled, you've, you've made null and void the Holy Spirit in your life and you've seared out the conscience to where you're not even listening to God anymore. You've just given yourself over to the flesh and you're not fighting anymore. The idea for a Christian is to be a soldier, to be fighting the good fight of faith. And over and over, I gave you some verses previously about warfare. We are to fight. And it's not just with the world. And sometimes we get this idea that the world's so much against Christians that our biggest battle is with trying to get the world converted and try to get the world to give us our freedoms and get enough people elected where we can Christianize the nation and all that kind of foolishness. That's not your biggest battle. This world is headed to hell in a handbasket. 
The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And that includes the good old U.S. of A. The Bible says love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So your biggest battle is not with the world and your biggest battle is not with the devil. The devil made me do it mentality. Yeah, the devil is your adversary. The Bible says he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the devil is not your biggest adversary. You've got to realize and understand that your biggest problem is you. My biggest problem is me. I gave you Galatians chapter number 5. Turn over to Romans chapter number 6 and... How do we fight this battle? I'll give you about five things here. Galatians, I mean Romans chapter number 6. The great thing about the Bible is the Bible never presents a problem that it doesn't present a solution. Man has a way of muddying the waters. And your own mind has a way of muddying the waters. But God is very straightforward and God will give you the problem. He'll lay it out. This is what's wrong. Then he'll give you the answer and he'll lay it out and say this is how you make it right. Okay, notice Romans chapter number 6. First point you want to notice in verses 11 and 12 is you have to reckon yourself dead to sin. Romans 6, 11. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that be alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. First, notice verses 11 and 12, you have to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. In chapter 7, he mentions a divorce that takes place, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and he compares that with the believer being divorced from the law and now being married to Christ. You know, when... Couples oftentimes have to go through the horrific tragedy of divorce. Oftentimes because kids are involved, there is never truly a divorce until 18 or 20 years later. Because as long as there's kids involved, there will always be some type of connection. Although it may not be a very uh, close connection, it may not be a friendly connection, it may not be a very good relationship type of connection, but there's a connection nonetheless. God says you need to reckon yourself dead to it. Now, when somebody dies in the Scripture, that is a divorce in the sense of, in the Old Testament even, when a spouse died, they were permitted and available to be able to go out and remarry. You are dead to this flesh. And you are to reckon yourself dead to this flesh. And the idea of you being dead to your flesh goes back to Christ on the cross. It doesn't say reckon sin to be dead. It says, reckon yourself dead to the sin. When you're identified with Christ, remember when we talked about being perfect in Christ, you're complete in Him, you're in Christ. You're identified with Christ on the cross. Your sins are nailed to the cross. You're identified with Christ in the tomb. Your sins are carried down into hell. You're identified with Christ rising again from the dead to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, the first four verses. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So how do you fight this battle? You reckon. In other words, you count. You appropriate, like we studied salvation. You appropriate it. You believe it. You apply it to yourself. I'm dead to that. So when that temptation comes, when that struggle comes, when that sin comes, you say, I'm dead to that. Now, dead people don't have any problem with sin. You can go down there and you can take any type of uh, drug that's very addictive and you can take it down there to the grave, graveside and you can drop it all over the grave. Those people down there in the tomb, they're not going to be tempted with that at all. They're completely dead to it. That's how we are to be. Dead to sin. Just dead to it. Turn from it. Repent from it. All right, so... The next thing you'll notice in verse number 13, I read that one. He says, neither yield yourselves as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield yourselves unto God. So number one, reckon yourself to be dead. Number two, yield yourself to God. You have to make up your mind if you're going to let God rule in you or if you're going to rule in you. Or are you going to have the works of the flesh or are you going to let God produce the fruit of the Spirit? You make that decision. 
You don't produce the fruit of the Spirit. He produces it through you. But you make the decision whether you're going to yield to God or not. That's why we get the word discipline or disciple. We talk about Christian discipline. There are some disciplines you should practice as a Christian. You should assemble together with believers when we can. You should spend time in prayer. You should spend time in His Word. There are certain things you should stay away from. Yield yourself unto God. There's a decision that has to be made there. You know, God is a whole lot bigger than your flesh. Jesus Christ is greater. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. There was this young boy and he went off to college. And he goes off to college and he's getting his dorm all set up. And he put all these posters on his wall. You know, he had these rock and roll bands and some obscene pictures and things like that. He had his room all decorated. So his mother, instead of just coming right out and rebuking him and ripping the posters down and things like that, she decided to send him the, one of the pictures that, they, that hung in their den for years and years and years. And it was one of these portraits of Christ praying at the Garden of Gethsemane. Somebody's portrait, kind of like a silhouette of Christ there. And the whole family just grew up seeing it. I mean, it was part of their family. And she sent that and she says, will you please hang this on your wall? And so to appease his mother, he hung it on his wall. The next time she went to visit his dorm, she found out that all the other pictures and obscene things had been taken down off of his wall. And she said, what happened to all your posters? He said, well, all the others seemed out of place after I put Jesus up in place. You know, if you put Jesus in the right place and yield unto God, all the other stuff that you think has such a hold on you won't have as strong a hold on you. Get closer to Him and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Number three. Number three, turn over to Romans chapter 13. Almost finished here. Romans chapter 13. Notice what he says. Romans chapter 13, verse number 14. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So don't make a provision, number three, don't make a provision for the flesh. The Bible says in James 1, 14 and 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. If you sow that seed of sin, it will bring forth a result. So the thing is, don't sow it. Don't make a provision for it. Don't look that way. Don't go to that place. Don't be around that particular person. Don't expose yourself to those people. Don't do something or be in a place or put yourself in a position that is inevitably going to yield to sin. Yield not to temptation, the song says. The best way not to yield to temptation is to stay away from it. What does he say in the Lord's Prayer? Deliver us from evil. Deliver us. Pray, Lord, make me to go on the path of thy commandments. Hide God's word in your heart that you won't sin against God. Make no provision for the flesh. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, you should have this verse memorized. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If it looks bad, stay away from it. Make no provision for the flesh. And then you see it also in the text, so we don't have to turn, but I'll give you the cross reference. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. And also Ephesians chapter 4, verses... 21, 22, 23, and 24. Colossians 3, 9, and 10, he mentions this as well, but also in the text we just read, Romans 13, 14, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Colossians 3, 9, and 10, he talks about put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man. So there is a repentance going on. There's a putting off, a laying aside of the old deeds, of the old man, and putting on the new man. And this leads me to my last one here. You see it in Ephesians 4 as well. But you're in Romans, so take a left turn back to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Be not conformed to this world. To be conformed is to be Worked at from the outside in. You take something, you beat it into shape, you conform it. Verse number two, but be ye transformed. That's from the inside out. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember what I told you about casting down strongholds in 2 Corinthians chapter 10? He says, casting down every imagination. So it has to do with the mind. 
So the idea is to renew your mind. You have to go back and say, you know what, I'm, I'm complete in Christ. I'm forgiven in Christ. I can give the fruit of the Spirit through Christ, therefore I'm not going to yield to this. So I see myself as far as my identity goes. I see myself as a Christian. I put on the new man. Therefore, there are certain things I'm just not going to do because that's not who I am. My belief affects my behavior. I can't go there or I can't do that or I can't watch that or I can't listen to that because of who I am. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2, let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You can renew your driver's license, but you're still the same person. You don't have to take the test over again. It's not saying you're getting saved all over again. You're just renewing that thing. You're going back saying, you know what? I'm making a recommitment, if you will, or I'm renewing my faith. I know that I'm saved, but I'm putting on Christ and I'm naming the name of Christ. So certain things are off limits. Certain things are off limits for Christians. Now, a believer can sin. I know that's a shock to some of you to think that you live a sinless life, but you can mess up. The Corinthians, they were contentious, they were proud, they were said to be carnal, they were committing fornication. The Colossians were told to stop their anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy communication, as well as their lying, Colossians 3.8. The Ephesians were warned about getting drunk. Ephesians 5.18. The Galatians were cautioned, and I gave you the verse and told you we'd finish up with it. They were cautioned that if, there, if they persisted in the works of the flesh, that they would not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. So what does that lead? That leads to the fact that the works of the flesh cannot affect your salvation. You can do any sin that any unsafe person can do, but you're not going to go to hell because you've committed those sins because you're a believer. People go to hell because of the sin of unbelief. I think we established that in the previous lessons. But you can lose a lot of things. You can lose your joy. You can lose your peace. You can lose your fellowship with other believers. You can lose your fellowship with the Lord. And you can lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ and at the future kingdom millennium when we rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. The Bible tells us some details about this in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and Ephesians 5. Romans 8, 17 is another cross-reference. Also in 2 John chapter 8, he says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. 1 Corinthians 3.15, If any man's work shall be burned, speaking of the judgment seat of Christ, he shall suffer loss. God does not want you to suffer loss. He does not want you to lose rewards. He wants you to have a full reward at the judgment seat of Christ. So he wants us to walk in the Spirit instead of walking in in the flesh. Yield to the Spirit, the new man, instead of yielding to the flesh. Your standing in Christ is absolute perfection. Your state, I don't know. You say, well, here I am, I'm in church. Well, not now, but <laughs> when you're in church, here you are, you're all dressed up, you look clean, you got your Bible, everything's great, you're in church. What's going on between your ears? Better yet, what's going on between your head and your heart? Where's your emotions? Where's your will? Where's your devotion? Where's your love? Where's your fervency for Jesus Christ? Are you yielding to the works of the flesh? Or are you yielding to the moving of the Holy Spirit? This is a very important teaching. I think it will help you if you're doubting your salvation, if you're struggling because you've committed sins after you've been saved, you don't know what to do with those. I'll tell you what to do with them. Take them to Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter number 1. He says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Don't keep it all bottled up. Be open to the Lord. Go to Him in humility and in honesty. And say, Lord, I messed up. Here's what I did. But I want your fellowship and forgiveness. And the Bible says He'll cleanse you from all sin. That concludes our study of our lesson of standing and state. Father, thank you for the scriptures. I pray that you'd help us to apply these things practically. Lord, so as Christians, we can have the testimony we need to have, but more importantly, we can be in fellowship with you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.